So we're going to talk about deliverance uh, today as a, as a form of prayer and um, I'm looking forward to that. But, but first of all, I guess there's concepts of why do we come into church? What is the role of church? And so I just want to throw up a, a thought here from Timothy Keller. And it says, what does God want for us, from, from, for us and from us? We understand that we are saved in order that we can be spent. We understand that God comes and lives in us, not so we can just be lethargic and self-centered, but that we can live large and positive and fruitful lives that I I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And there is a world that is perishing that needs that truth. Amen. So what does God want for us? And then what does he want from us? And Keller says this, to be loved, but not known is comforting, but superficial. You can read a book about Bono or Nelson Mandela and know and actually love him, but you really don't know him. You can know about him, but it ends up being a superficial love. You understand what I'm saying? To be known and not loved, well, that's our greatest fear. Yeah, I know all about this person and quite frankly, yeah, I don't love him at all. Out to be really known, to be exposed, to be to be um, identified with, that's our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. This is the role of the church, to bring you and the Father and be able to create avenues for that connection to take place, for us to be able to practice together, encourage one another, share our stories and our testimonies, to challenge, to champion, to prune and discipline, as well as be able to resource and rejoice. Come on, this is, this, that's actually, that's actually, I, I made all that up just then. That was just rolled off the tongue. That's just poetry. That's honey. And you just went, oh yeah. No, because that's the role of the church, that we actually come together and we unfold our journeys together so that when one of us is standing by ourselves, we can actually have a group of people come around and go, hey, I want you to be known and I want you to be loved. I want you to know the Father and love the Father and I want the Father to know you and love you. We want to help create safe spaces for all of this to happen, the good, the bad, the ugly. Right? I shouldn't have looked at you when I said ugly, but that's okay. All right? So we, we want to be able to create these spaces. This is the function of the church, not to do life for you, not to do this spirituality for you, but to be able to create spaces for us to practice and grow in that together. So indeed, you can be fully known, fully known by, by God. And then fully loved by God. I wonder how that would transform how we walk into Monday. I am fully loved by God. He knows what I've done. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows where I fall down. He knows my fears and doubts. He knows my questions and my concerns. But I feel nothing but absolute acceptance from him. Fully loved. And then being able to extend that out to the world. Not, oh, you did this and didn't do this and you took my car spot and someone should have given me more love hearts on my Instagram post. And all of a sudden, I actually, I'm actually loving the world as the Father loves us. The church is actually intended to be that vehicle, that vessel, that instrument that helps move that forward. Not just do it for you. This is a fueling station for your Mondays. This is not, this is not the end goal. Where you are sitting right now is not God's greatest purpose and design for your life. This is called attending a church service. You can be a Christian and not come into a church service. I don't think you can be good. I don't think you can be smart. I don't think you can be as productive if you are not gathering together. But this is not the end goal. This is the stepping point. Oh, good. All right. All right, so I just thought I'd, I just wanted to set that up a little bit. Um, we're going to move into this uh, contemplative, not contemplative, that was two weeks ago. I've stolen all of Simon's notes here. I'm looking. But um, we're going to talk about deliverance. So 
Uh, what's the first slide up there? Oh, so where are we going today? I did steal this directly from you, Simon. I thought it was great. So we're going to talk about what is deliverance, a scriptural foundation. You might need to take your phone out and take some, take some screenshots or write some notes down. I hope you're writing notes down. I know you can come back and watch this uh, through the week. I know that you're not because YouTube tells us how many views we have, but I'll, I'll leave that with you and your conscience. But I, I, want you to, I, just, <laughs> I just want you to take some notes or write some stuff down, all right? A scriptural foundation. What is deliverance prayer? What deliverance is not, all right? So I know that we've all been really informed in the deliverance space by the iconic movie, the Exorcist. I know we all think that it's all about Linda Blair, a head spinning around and spewing up a pea soup, right? It's not that. We're going to talk about that a little bit. How not to, some common hang-ups. Then what is it? And then you can try this at home. Here's a little home test kit for you that we can go home and we can start doing some deliverance. So long as there is a promise that if your husband or your wife or your child doesn't do something that you don't like, you go, you need deliverance. You've got a demon. What's your name? Tell me, you know, so you're just going to just pump the brakes on that one, okay? We're going to make this really safe. And again, I want to let you know that the expectation isn't that this is going to be something that you're going to do every day with every person you meet. Please don't do this on the bus. Please don't do this, you know, over a cup of tea or at Smoko because it's just going to go badly for you and it's not going to bear fruit for them. It's not going to bring God glory or them freedom. So we're just giving you one of the extra tools about what deliverance and prayer, how that intersects with our spiritual formation. Cool? Yeah, so therefore, you can either come on the journey, you know what we've just done over the last 10, 15 minutes, or indeed you can actually start acting some of these things out in your own life because Jesus just wants you free, not living in that box of scorpions. We all good? Yeah. Outstanding. So this is all just for you, Laura, because Laura said, I have never heard a message on deliverance. So why deliverance? Well, first of all, deliverance is actually talked about in the Bible 244 times. I know, I went through. It took me ages. It took me the last three weeks. <laughs> Starting in Genesis 1, I went through and counted 244 times. They used, uh, you're shaking your head at me, Tim. Am I lying up here? I think I might thank God for Google. Um, but it talks about deliverance, delivery, to deliver uh, 244 times. God is invested in, in seeing us live in freedom. It is central to the set free ministry and indeed to the heart of God. It is central to what we just talked about with the message of John 11, with Lazarus going, come forth, let there be life. And then we actually get to live life not bound by a whole bunch of addictions and, and, and uh, weights in our life. He actually wants us living free. Can you say amen to that? It's one thing to be a Christian. We have people all over the globe who are, have got their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life and are living a less than life. Yeah. Yeah. There are people who, have got their, who are going, I am a Christian, but they've just got these great big butts. But I could do this, but I should do that, but I would do this if I did. And there's all these hang-ups because there is restriction, there is limitation. Amen. You don't, if there is something lacking or there's something needed in our life, you do not need deliverance from something that you already have or something you are already free from. You're, this is all about adding to and extending and upgrading your life. So this is why we're talking about deliverance. There's no, there's no experts in this room. I know we've got a couple of people who are passionate, who are growing. There are experts in on, in the land, can I, be, can I ask you just to be super careful by who you check out on YouTube? Just, just, just be careful about that, all right? Because there are some absolute weirdos out there who will lead you into a cul-de-sac and leave you there. So just be careful. But this is an essential part of the ministry of Jesus. This is actually where he says, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The Greek word saved is sozo. Sozo means to save, give eternal life, to heal, to bring back health to our bodies and to our minds, and to deliver. Sozo, save, heal, deliver. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. 
This was his message. This was his mission. He said, the Son of Man has come to destroy the works of the enemy. This is what we're called to go and do. We're all good. This is why we're talking about deliverance. It is not limited to the Russell Crowe movie. What's that one? Is it the Gladiator? I was probably thinking more about the Pope's Exorcist, which is his newest one. But thanks for the input. Um, <laughs> so we're not talking about this as being in the realms of Hollywood. So let's have a quick chat. Um, what's, have I got a slide? That, what is deliverance? Oh, so deliverance is freedom from, freedom for. There's some positives and there's some negatives in here. So the positives, there's some things which you deliver which are really good. And we're not really going to talk about those this morning as much. But you deliver a child into the world, right? You deliver a promise. You deliver purpose. You get a delivery. This is again for you, Laura. She gets more deliveries sent to the office than I don't. I don't know what sort of budget you give your wife, Steve Bain, but she has got deliveries coming in, left, right, center. But, but a message, I'm just here to deliver a message. I'm, there's an order, there's a gift, there's a promise. I'm delivering on my promise to you. There is a great sense of when Jesus came and then he released the Holy Spirit to us is him delivering on the promise. When they, the day of Pentecost came and they were all gathered together in one place, Jesus has said, go back, wait in Jerusalem for the gift, for the power I'm going to give you to fulfill the commission I gave you in Matthew 28. I am delivering on the promise through the Holy Spirit. So deliverance, when we actually can talk about delivery, I'm receiving a delivery, that's kind of good. Or something has actually been delivered from me, it can be a gift, it can be an, uh, an understanding, it can be a tool, it can be a story. Now, we also have to be able to go, so we're released from or for the negative, the bad, the, the, some of the bad stuff there. And I tried to play with the word negative because I didn't want to be a downer, but it kind of fits, all right? So come with me. Unclean spirits. We're released we're given freedom from bondage that could be behavioral, it could be our thinking, it can be our feelings. All right? Please understand that we have got body, soul, and spirit. Our soul is our emotions, our will, our feeling, and that is where most Christians live, and that is why most Christians live based on their feelings. I just feel, I just think. I'm just a little bit upset right now. I'm just a little bit of this or I'm just a little bit of that. And it's all about this behavioral thinking, feeling, as opposed to what the Lord of God's word says. The Lord of the Lord says. And it's about faith. It's about obedience. We're delivered from opposition, an enemy, a season, a circumstance. We don't like talking about enemies here in Australia. We're kind of too nice for that. And all oh, no, we talk about enemies, us and them, and we don't like that. And we all just want to be enmeshed together. No, we actually have an enemy, beloved. Yeah. The enemy is not flesh and blood, Ephesians 6 tells us, but it's powers and principalities. That is again trying to lie to us about who we are, what we're called to do, and how we can actually go about doing it. We actually do have an enemy. He is the father of lies. He is the accuser of the brethren. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he is going to seed into your life like mushroom spores so that mold grows up in your life. All manner of different behaviors, thinkings, feelings, actings, uh, identity issues, wounds that stay open so you can just come and lay eggs into those wounds. We all doing okay? I know this is heavy. I know this is full on, but we're just going to get through this and I, I think we'll come away stronger and more informed people. I, I believe we're going to come away with some practices that we can start maybe doing in our own spaces, in our own prayer life, or even just starting to, to ask some questions with one another uh, and be curious. Is that kind of cool? So what else is deliverance? Um, as the positive, well, you're going to need the Holy Spirit because it's not you who delivers anybody. Um, we are conduits of the Holy Spirit. We stand on the word. You're going to need time. You're going to need team. You're going to need the right temperament. Okay, so again, we come back to that concept. If we talk about deliverance, you go, why are you talking about, about deliverance? Like, I, I know my family. Yeah, I mean, my family needs deliverance, but I'm never, not going to do that with them over Christmas, or I'm not going to do this in the workplace uh, because it's a secular workplace. Uh, so, but you need the right temperament to be able to hold and to steward stuff. You know, I mean, I think that one of the great signs of spiritual maturity is to be able to receive an understanding about something and then not just have to run off and do it in 4.5 seconds. You know, it's just mature. God does, you know, he works in two time frames, soon and suddenly. 
He says, you steward the soon. You stand in the soon. You pray in the soon. I'll do the suddenly. Oh, no, but we've got to do the suddenly. It's because I got an idea. Or I had a prophetic word. Or I had something, something. And I've got, to, I've got to kick down walls and open up doors. And we end up being the seven sons of Sceva who are not prepared for what comes. You might want to go back and read that seven sons of Sceva. It's in Acts somewhere, I'm pretty sure. What are you going to expect? Pain, blood, travailing. Now, again, blood, it doesn't actually mean prayer. If you're praying and there's blood going everywhere, you, can't, you might be doing it wrong. All right? Uh, so I'm not talking about blood. I'm talking about in terms of delivering, in terms of giving birth to something. I, um, I left that word up there because I want you to know that this is actually not something that you just go, this is not just, I'll oh, oh, bless you prayer. This is not just a soft, oh, just, just, God, just be so kind to people this week and just ask you just, just be kind to their heart, give them a great night's sleep. This is not that. This is actually warfare prayer. Okay, this is going into battle. This is contention. This is, this is a wrestle. This is against an enemy. Okay, you know what I'm saying there? So this concept of pain, blood, travailing, it requires repetition, patience. It may require you to pause for a little bit or it's actually gonna, you're going to get some pushback. You've got to be prepared for all of that. Okay, if we set up deliverance prayer and just go, off you go, then you're going to get beaten up out there. You're going to get disappointed out there. You're going to half start something and someone's life is not going to be better because of the prayers you prayed. They're going to be more confused, right? If you don't stay the course with this, if you're not willing to, hey, let's just rest for a minute. Let's just take some time out. All right, so we all good? Yeah. All right, let me just keep on rolling here. Um, let me just say that um, deliverance uh, is actually not for, there's, 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 you've got exorcism, and you've got deliverance. Exorcism is for a possessed person, a person who is no longer in control of any facet of their life. And it is the theological foundation, I'm not going to go into it today, that a Christian, a believer, someone who has received Jesus is not possible to be possessed. That is the inner workings of our heart. That inner temple is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I have become a possession of God through faith. But I can be oppressed. I can be bound. I can be restricted. I can be in a tight space. Sometimes that tight space is almost like a womb, which is actually causing me to, to grow and to wrestle and, and go, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for something to break out into something. I'm ready to be delivered into something. Other times that is a bondage. It is a binding. It is a restriction. It is a limitation upon us. Now, Christians can know that, not possession. Is that Okay. You just need to know, oh, I'm not possessed. Now, if you're a believer and you've actually received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, possession of you is not possible. Oppression is. Deliverance is about releasing the oppressed. Exorcism is about releasing the possessed. All right? We're not going into exorcism and possession. That's the realm of the exorcist. All right? We're going into how we take our prayers to see this Bondage into this limitation lifted off of us. Excellent. So, okay, so, so let's, can we just do a really quick scriptural foundation? Can we do that? Just so you make sure that I'm not actually making this up uh, or I'm, I'm taking all my information from Hollywood or YouTube. Um, so you'll see there, there's a whole bunch of scriptures. I'm just going to read some of them. This is where you might, again, might, might take your, take your um, phone out. For, and so to Samuel. For this, I will give thanks and praise you. O Lord among the nations, I'll sing praises to your name. He is a tower of salvation and great deliverance. My, my, probably my favorite, uh, in fact, probably one of my favorite verses of all time is actually Exodus 14. And, and it's actually Egypt, or the Israelites have been released from 400 years of slavery from Egypt that in order that they may go and worship God has said, I'm going to release my people in order that they may worship me. They may be one with me. They may reinstitute the, 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 the tabernacle, that tent of meeting, that I and my people can be one and that they would be free. He delivers them from Egypt. 
Yeah? And then we understand that as they go out, they get to the Red Sea, and then Pharaoh's going, hang on a second, I've just lost my whole workforce. And so he comes charging in after them. They've got the Red Sea in front of them. They've got the, the uh, Egyptian chariots behind them, and they all start freaking out, mumbling and grumbling. And it says, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us just serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm. Now, if we're going to do any form of deliverance, if we're going to talk about deliverance here, if we're going to do deliverance like we've already done this morning, it wasn't that wacky, was it? It wasn't that strenuous. It wasn't that scary. If we're going to do this, we need to be able to say, do not be afraid. Stand firm. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians that you see coming over the hill, the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Someone needs to say hallelujah. Someone needs to give thanks for the bondage that's on their life and their minds, their thinking, their heart, their family, their addictions, their attitudes. When God sets me free, I will be free indeed. And I'm giving you some praise in advance, Lord Jesus. You can go through Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel. Go and do a word search. Go and get a decent Bible. uh, And you can use Bible Gateway. There's a blue letter Bible. There's a whole bunch of online stuff. Or you can just get a good old-fashioned Bible. And you can open to the back. And if it's actually done right, it'll actually have a, what we call a, a, not quite a, but hang on a second. I'm struggling with that. Here we go. And in the back of your decent Bible will be all of these words for deliver, deliverance, deliver, deliverer, delivers, deliver. And there are all these verses in here. Deliver the poor who cried out, for you have delivered my soul. For he who has delivered me delivers me into life. All things have been delivered by you. You know what I'm saying? Old Testament, New Testament, time's running out. I'm not going to go through those verses. But go and do a word search. Go and type into Google how many times does, does the word deliver appear. Read it in your favorite translation. Go back and look at how many times and how invested God is in our deliverance and indeed what has been done in us, what has been done for us, he wants to do through us. So there is, and again, forgive me, but I could probably go and I could read all of these verses for all time. Let me do one more. Let me do the very last one. Because I think it's I think it's I think it's most Christians sort of closet favorite verse. It says, For I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. Don't put your hand up if you go, yeah, that actually brought me peace the first time I heard Paul say that. For the good I want to do, I don't do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Verse 24, Romans 7, 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. God is so interested and invested and committed to deliverance. There should be one more verse up there if you actually want to look at a deliverance prayer. And it's one that we've been um, using as a, a whole, uh, like an anchor point for all of this. Have we got that next one up there, Sue? Oh, no, it's not there. Can you, can you see the one where it's got the Lord's Prayer in it, Sue? Is that, did, I, did I miss that out? There it is. There's a deliverance prayer. Jesus was praying and his disciples said, teach us how to pray. He said, when you pray, say, our Father, hallowed be your name. There's the adoration. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, as Sam preached last week. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. We had a crack at that this morning, right? Yeah. Practice it together. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the one. Jesus is teaching his disciples, you and me, 
Just say, deliver me, Lord God. Deliver me like you deliver Paul from that wretched body. Deliver me like you delivered Israel from the Egyptian hordes. Deliver me, God. And it's a daily practice and it's something that God wants us to be able to have knowledge about and we've just put it off into the realms of the kooky, spooky, super spiritual Hollywood or it's an embarrassment to the church. I'll just hold that out there together. You can be uncomfortable with it if you like. Um, So um, I should go then, Sue, what deliverance is not. Is where, ah, there we go. Good job. Thank you so much. So deliverance is not, we're not, is not the exorcist. It's archaic. So it's not meaning it's not historical. We used to do it. We don't do it anymore. And it's not an embarrassment. Setting someone free should not be an embarrassment. We are living in an age where the mental health uh, requirements of workplaces and homes and for our elite athletes as as much as everybody else is an ongoing concern. And we are so grateful when someone goes, I'm really not doing okay. We go, oh, we're so proud of you. So go and do the things that you need to go and do to get yourself well because we're sick and tired of seeing this tsunami, right, of self-harm on our land or the eruption of addiction and anger in our homes. So we go, yes, go and get it. So, so getting delivered is not a point of embarrassment. We have these words delivered. We have these words submitted. Oh, I'm submitted. I'm submitted. And we get this word goes submitted. Oh, that means I'm weaker. Or that means I'm less than. Or that means, oh, who are you to say that you should da 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 Submission means you're controlling me. No, it doesn't. Submission means I'm actually lowering myself in order that you can come in and therefore we are greater. We submit to one another as Ephesians 5 says. We honor one another and through an act of submission, through an act of humility, we actually get our lives added to, we get to add to somebody else's life and then we are bigger all over again. But the devil lies about these words. Submission, what are you saying? What are you, are you, are you the boss of me? You're not my mum. Deliverance is not an end in and of itself. Rather, it is the means to an end. We are not, the goal is not to get someone delivered, but from deliverance, they step into holiness, wholeness, and deeper intimacy. The goal is not, the goal is not that we get to pray and say, okay, so let's just spend some time with the Holy Spirit asking, what does he want to release off you today? That's the means to the ends. The ends that I'm walking free. I'm walking fragrant. I'm walking full of hope and expectation. And unlike I have before, uh, deliverance is not a cure-all nor a solution to every problem. Again, right? So, you, you know, you're trying to cast out the smell of mud and you're unhung washing. Stop doing that. You know, it's not, it's not, that's not what it is. It's not going to make all of your problems go away because it's not a substitute for spiritual practices. It is one, but it's not a substitute for them. So we pray, we fast, we read the word, we come into fellowship, we submit to one another, we bring our, we bring our weaknesses, our faults and our fears, and we talk about them together. We don't just need to go, oh, okay, so you've had a bad day. Well, let's just move into some deliverance then. Oh, you didn't cook my favorite meal. What? Tell me your name. You knew. You're doing that on purpose. It's not a shortcut. You still need to exercise discipline. You still need to learn to resist the enemy. You still need to learn how to daily walk in the spirit. We're doing okay now. Just demystifying the whole deliverance stuff. So when we come in on Sunday morning and we do this, you go, okay, so this is, we talk about the word deliverance. And people aren't going, ho, 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 ho. No, that should be done somewhere else. That should be done. It's not for church. We don't, church doesn't do that anymore. Heck we do. All right. What's the next one? I think we've done that one. Thank you, Sue. So what is deliverance prayer? Cleans house by asking and inviting God. By asking and inviting God. This is where you can start doing this at home. This is a little bit of your, let's just take this home. Let's just take this to my prayer chair, my prayer closet, on my walk. Now, I get it. There are great times when we want to bring people in around those spaces so that I can actually relax And I've got other people who are prayed up, fasted up, and focused on being able to just do some some, uh, environmental things. And I just get to submit and surrender. 
and I've got a whole bunch of other people praying for me, right? But it's just still inviting God to show and to highlight what he wants to do and where he wants it to happen. Deliverance prayer is not someone pushing their own agenda on you. Deliverance prayer, recognizing and revealing the sin that gives legal rights to unclean spirits. Yep, so we're asking, Holy Spirit, would you reveal to us what are the strongholds, what, what areas have I actually left the laundry door unlocked and I've got stuff walking in and out of my life. And you can say, well, I don't really have a problem. And I would say, stop lying to yourself. You may have a beautiful home. You may have a wonderful marriage. Your finances may be in line. You may sleep great. But every time you walk past the spare bedroom, that reeks of death. There is a fear there. If there, someone finds that out, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be exposed for being some filthy degenerate sinner. There is a stronghold there. You have an unclean spirit squatting in your home. It doesn't have to take over the whole home. It doesn't have to be in the living room where we bring people in and have our cups of tea. It doesn't have to be in the bedroom. But there is a some point and some place in our lives that we are going, I want to recognize and I want it revealed, Holy Spirit, what, where you want to do to get that unclean spirit out of my life. Here's where we've gone off track with deliverance is often we've just prayed about those things as opposed to telling those things to go to hell. Get out. Expel. Jesus, when the demons actually saw Jesus, they freaked out. They started telling uh, the world who should have recognized him who he was and he commanded them to be quiet and to come out. Jesus said, come out. What I love in Mark 1, you've got Jesus as he comes back from the desert, comes back from being baptized in the Holy Spirit, comes back, begins his ministry, very first Sunday, rocks up to synagogue, comes in the synagogue, they hand him the scroll of Isaiah 61. How many times have we preached that, right? But as he's doing this, there is a guy who's come to synagogue. All right? There's a person who's come and sat in the pews, parked their donkey, rolled on in, sung their Jewish songs, and then Jesus starts to preach and they start manifesting. It happens in the church. You know what Jesus does? Jesus speaks to the spirit and not to the man. He casts the spirit out of the synagogue, not the man out of the church. Because why? He's invested in our freedom. Where does he want us? He wants us in church. He wants us in community. He just wants us there whole. And when stuff starts to stir up, he goes, Oi! Shut it! And get out! Naming unclean spirits, rebuking and expelling them is a significant part of that. So let's stop praying for people's problem and start telling the problem to go to hell. Just saying, we're all doing okay. I've had three weeks off. Laura, you can blame Laura. She said, I wanted a message on deliverance, so I'm just giving it my best two barrels, all right? I'm just looking at Karen and Beth. I'm just saying, there's my Reed. Where's Mattel? Am I doing okay? Am I crossing lines? I'm doing all right. We've got to keep going, though. Tears down spiritual strongholds, claims and reestablishes Jesus' complete victory. Somebody say amen. Moving on. So let's try this at home. All right. So we're landing. Everyone just... Oh, yeah. I know there's a car wash to happen. Sam's eager. Look at him. He wants to run. He's like, like Archer, ready to go to the kids' church. So, so if, you, if we're going to establish deliverance, freedom, if we're going to talk to these unclean spirits, right? There's nothing to fear about them. They're more terrified of us than we are terrified of them. We've just Hollywooded them up. All right? We've just gone, I'm not prepared. I don't know my identity. I don't understand the authority of the word. That actually comes down to a discipling connected issue, not actually an authority identity issue. Yeah. Identity issue. So if we're going to talk to these unclean spirits, either you're going to talk to your own or you're going to help some people talk to Pete's. All right? Let's start with the gospel. Let's start with the love of God. I'm, I'm here to tell you, I actually think that if we actually fan our identity in who God is and what he's done in me, we actually may not need as much prayer as we think we do. 
Because the person of Jesus, I think I've quoted this about four times already this morning, that who the Son sets free is free indeed. And when that light of love comes into my life, when the truth of who Jesus is comes into my life, when I actually stand there and go, I am fully known and I am fully loved, you watch 90% of the stuff rack off automatically. It's gone, I'm out. I'm done. I, I did not sign up for this. These demons are scared. They're pathetic. They're tiny. You remember seeing those uh, almost Walt Disney-esque type, it's not probably Walt Disney, but, but cartoon pictures of this little, little mouse that comes creeping in, but its shadow is projected on the wall like some massive creature, right? That's little demons, mate. Now, we're not talking about powers, principalities. We're talking about there's some big suckers out there. Let's just pump the brakes on that for this morning, all right? I, I, I've dug a hole. It's filling with water. I'm trying to get out, so help me. But these demons aren't that big. They're not that scary if we actually understand what the gospel actually is. We actually understand the true authority of light, love, and the word of God. We actually understand that in the name of Jesus... Every tongue will confess and every knee shall bow and every demon is going to suffer that's been causing you to suffer. It's time to get out. It's moving day. It's moving day. I've got the authority of the Holy Spirit. I've got the gun of the word. I've got Jesus on my shoulder going, go boy, go, 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 go. You go, you go, you go. Go and do it. This is fun. I've done my bit. You go. I'm seated at the right hand of the Father. It's your crack. This is why I left you here. Get amongst it. Let's try that. And this is what we do every single week. You're created in and for love. You broke it. I broke it. I get to say I'm sorry. Right? It was reconciled to Jesus through the cross. Back into full relationship with the Father. Restored. We say sorry, thank you, please. Or if you need another form of prayer... Acknowledge it, believe it, confess it. Acknowledge I've stuffed it, your God. Believe you love me and you forgive me. Confess it, I'm free, you live in me. Take a photo, go and walk the dog and go through those six words, come back and your marriage and your life will be better. It's the first steps only because then all things are made new, now we release the new person. We've talked enough about uh, Lazarus. And there's verse 14. Unwrap him and let him go. Right? Last one. Confess, repent, receive forgiveness, forgive others, recognize areas of bondage and sin, especially in the occult and the demonic. Can I just put it out there for free? Don't do Halloween. Just for whatever it's worth. If that upsets you, up and good. Because it's, a, it's the worship of demonic rubbish. It's bringing death into your home and dressing kids up as a little mermaid or as some flopping psychotic axe murderer is not good for their soul. And where's my online family? Talking to you too. Now, kid comes to your door, knock, 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 trick or treat. This is love on them. Let's just, let's just not be psychos, all right? Just go, no, 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 I'm sorry we don't do that. I'm an Australian. That's just, that's just free. That's just, that's just a... But the occult and the demonic, hello? Hello. Nice house, but the back shed, spare room, hallway, closet is a war zone, reeks of death, so tell it to get out. Team, why don't you come and join me? <sighs> Karen's keen. She's ready to go. She's going to get my husband off that stage. <laughs> Hey, Father, why don't you stand with me? Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're going to finish by singing Sam's song, but we're going to do this. You can grab these notes. You can watch YouTube back. You can take some photos. Do this yourself. Have a crack. Get around some people. Get into a small group. Say, let's talk about this. Let's roll this thing through. But it's actually not about trying to grab someone, stick them in the middle and go, tell us all your sins. Who's, going to, who's doing that? Because if that's what your small group's going to do, can you just let me know? Because I'm not going to it. Right? I'm just not going. But it's actually about this act with the Father. Now, if I've got stuff that I can't deal with on my own, then I bring in some help. Sure. Absolutely. But let's... Sorry, so sorry. So can we go back to that very last one? I know we're running time. 
So let's do this. Hey, Jake, hey, can we, Karen, would you just play something for me when you, when you got a sec? <laughs> so let's just, can we just take out that universal position, just of softness, of surrender, of submission? Father, we come and we confess all this stuff to you. Even as, even as your word has been here, your spirit's been here, there's been stuff highlighted to me. I've winked at, I've nodded at, I've laughed at, I've let come in through Netflix or through something else. And you're showing me this morning, Father, it's not your best. It's actually a permission point in my life. I confess that to you. And I, and I say, I'm sorry. I repent. I turn away from it. You know, and, and beloved, some of our addictions are actually going to be solved right here and right now. Some of these anxieties and these worries are going to be, are going to be purged off your life right now. Others, you're going to want to continue to do this a few times with, or you may want some friends. But I repent, I turn away, and I receive your forgiveness, Father. I don't want to limp in shame. I don't want to be trying to bring my brokenness to you when you go, why are you, why are you walking broken? I've made you whole. So I receive your forgiveness. Before you set me free, I want to make sure I've set everybody else around me free. Mother, father, sister, brother, neighbor, I recognize some areas that are no longer healthy for me. I know I recognize some areas which are, to be honest, have been healthy for a while. And now in Jesus' name, I tell you to leave. I expel you. I cast you out. And as the team sings, just so that no one else can hear you around you, you might just want to start saying, get out. Holy Spirit's highlighting to you some unclean things in your life and you just get to tell them to get out. Get out. Get out. And it's okay if there is a physical manifestation. You may feel sick. You may want to burp. You may want to uh, yawn. You may want to cough. You may feel like you want to vomit. Then quickly run outside. But this is all just the spirits coming out of you that have been taking up residency in you and Jesus wants you free. Holy Spirit, as we sing, Holy Spirit, as we come and close, I'm asking that you're going to honour your word, honour your heart, honour this place of honesty and set us free. As my brothers and sisters start telling things to get out of their life, move, move in Jesus.